Hi everyone, and uh, so many people and uh, almost normally distributed. <laughs> I'm really worried because it's the biggest audience I've ever had and uh, all, uh, the biggest English-speaking audience because it's my the very first talk in English ever. So, uh, and today we are going to talk about whether it's possible to use Kotlin for data science. And spoiler, it's possible. <laughs> so, uh, let's start uh, from the name of the talk, data science. I'm expecting that if you are here, you are uh, familiar with data science and you know what data science is, you know the general concepts, main instruments, and so on. And uh, it's the right point to verify this assumption and uh, who of you uh, is uh, who of you feels confident in data science? Okay, <laughs> okay, and uh, who just think that it's a buzzword and it would be interesting to play with data in Kotlin at some point? Me also from the second group. And like a year ago, we started, after the uh, last Kotlin Conf, we started a project called Kotlin for Data Science in, at JetBrains. And to get, uh, today I'm happy to share the, some progress and what we are working on for making this experience more pleasant and more enjoyable. And I do believe that the best way to show everything uh, is just a practical example. Usually it's not that easy to find a piece of data that could be interesting for the whole audience, but this time I think that I found such uh, data set. And today we are going to analyze Kotlin Slack. Who's on Kotlin Slack? Quite a lot of people. And use this link if you are not in Kotlin Slack because there are lots of interesting discussions. And today we'll try to uh, analyze the structure of this uh, Slack community, some patterns, some uh, topics which we are discussing, and basically that's it. It sounds interesting? Yeah. Cool. So, when we are talking about data science, usually we uh, think about two words. First one is Python, and we will talk about it a bit later. And the other one is uh, Jupyter. And uh, Jupyter basically, who knows what Jupyter is? Yeah, so it's basically the most uh, popular tool in data science. It's kind of interactive shell. You have uh, different uh, cells, and uh, some cells could be just a text with markdown syntax, even latex formulas, and other text are code. And you can execute this code with the help of kernel. Jupyter comes with IPython kernel, but one can write its own kernel, and we wrote uh, Kotlin Jupyter kernel. And um, today, I'll show how it works. So it's a demo time now, and uh, first, how to install it. Actually, you have to use Conda at the moment. Who, who knows what Conda is? It's kind of a package manager, hugely popular in data science community. And uh, you type just Conda install Jupyter kernel minus C JetBrains, which means uh, channel JetBrains. And it tried to resolve your environment and uh, install the package. And surprisingly, it's already installed on my laptop. Next, I can just run it and here it is. We have Kotlin type of notebooks. Let's create it and type something like 10 plus 10. We are still waiting while the kernel is starting and yeah, here it is. Kotlin and Jupyter. It could be Python. <laughs> <laughs> of color. So let's let's write something more meaningful like uh, um, something like oops, wrong one. 
hello Kotlin conf. And execute it. Well, print what? Print clone. Cool. It works, and now let's take a look at our data. So we have a data folder here, and there are many, many, many of folders with the name of channels in Slack, and in every folder we have a number of JSONs uh, with basically messages. And finally, we have several uh, JSONs, one for channels, one for users, and integration, I don't know what is it. So let's take a look at users. So it's a JSON with, uh, so it's an array with objects and every object has its ID, name, time zone. Time zone, it's interesting because it gives us ability to analyze ge uh, geographical distribution and um, some profile information. By the way, it's the profile of Hadi Hariri. He created this lag. Thanks, Hadi. <laughs> so, and, um, well, we need some library to read this JSON. I personally love Klaxon. So um, let's go to Klaxon page from Burp, uh, on GitHub. And to edit, I need JCenter and uh, here are coordinates. So I can write something like this, add file. Oop. File repository and add JSON to now. HTTPS JSON dot com. Then um, I can add a dependency, depends on, and copy and paste this these coordinates here. And finally, I also need to import compist and Klaxon. That's it. Now we have a Klaxon object. We have a Klaxon object, but we lost 95% of all data scientists because it's weird. <laughs> Nobody wants to write such stuff. And it's really, um, so now we can write something like use Klaxon, and basically with the same result. So it's kind of a magic, and it automatically downloads the dependency in the local repository and uh, uh, write all necessary imports and so on. Okay, so now we need to create a, some data class that represents this user. I will actually use only ID and time zone label. So data class user val ID of string and time zone label also string. Now we have this class and let's read users. Our users. Uh, Klaxon parse array. Unfortunately, we have kind of completion, but it's not real completion here, so it's kind of, it can complete only local f um, um, variables. So uh, we will improve it later, I hope so. So, and it needs uh, the string, so we will use the file data uh, users JSON read text and we need import file as well import Java IO oops Java IO and up something goes wrong uh, is because sometimes we don't know times on label on defined um, 
Cool. Now we have users object and it looks like this. Let's take a look how many people on Slack. Oh, this user object is um, nullable, but we already know that it isn't, and it's kind of dumb. We need to think how to improve it later in REPL mode, but for now I'll say that no, no, it's not null. And uh, yeah, now we know the number of people are in our Slack, and uh, we can filter it, for example, uh, using uh, time zone filter um, it time uh, time zone labor contains let's say Europe and how many people in Europe user time zone label yeah sometimes it's really hard without completion <laughs> Contains. <laughs> cool. So, 7,000 people from Europe, and uh, we actually would like to have a distribution and to look at distribution. So, we need some lab plotting library. And uh, we have one. Uh, let me introduce Let's Plot. So, Let's Plot, it's a library which we are currently working on. It's inspired by Grammar of Graphics. Uh, who've heard about a gram of graphics? So, not so many people. So the idea is that the whole plot is split on um, into different parts. One is data and lots of layers and some statistics attributes and so on. And in data, we have series and every uh, geometry primitive can have mapping on on the series. Basically, that's it. And uh, the, there is a ggplot2 package in R, basically one of the standard uh, de facto in R, and it's hugely popular because it's really handy. And the other reason why we decided to work with this library is that um, it actually plays really well with Kotlin D cell syntax. But currently, we are providing uh, kind of R syntax for this. So. Uh, it's all Kotlin, it's multi-platform, and it gives ability to create interactive graphics from Kotlin or even Python API because of the native target. Uh, lots of different targets, it looks like this, and uh, let's try to use it. So I'm continuing uh, with the demo, and I say that let's use Let's Plot. And here, uh, I need first create some, um, let's call it time zones. And it, it's basically the data part of the um, plot. So it would be a, a map, it, um, and the, series, the first series is called time zone, two uh, users map it time zone label. Here it is. So now let's plot this data. Let's plot time zones. No layers on plot. Yes, because we didn't add them. Uh, so let's add some statistical uh, layers so like start count. And here it is. Also, we can add some size. Uh, Cool, now we can clearly see that the biggest part of the, uh, our community from Central Europe, also lots of people from uh, Pacific area and uh, India, Central, well, something like this. And uh, basically that's it about users, and let's now analyze our channels. But before starting with analyzing channels, there is a really meaningful question is whether it's the only library which we can use with the kernel. Obviously, it's not. And kernel comes with config.json file, which contains uh, all default repositories and then number of libraries. Uh, every library has 
uh, its alias, then repository dependencies, uh, imports, and in it, in it, in initial code that runs when we execute use magic. And the very important thing, renderers. So when we see that the result of the cell is of the class like this, we can apply some transformation on top of this class and draw it in a convenient way to user. So I know that there are many uh, library authors in this auditory. So if you uh, want to um, contribute this, your library to the community, you can contribute to config.json and it will be easy to use your library. Or you can create a, your own config and put in your um, home folder and uh, then it, all these changes will apply only, to, uh, lo only locally. So, one of such libraries is Krangle, and uh, written by Holger Brendel, and it's a library which basically gives us data frames, and it uh, has uh, interface in uh, Kotlin, and it's all written in Kotlin. So, uh, I already created a, some notebook for this, no more typing, and uh, channels. So I use Krangle and Let's Plot, and uh, kernel starting, it's, sometimes it's too long. Okay, then uh, I actually read data frame from JSON uh, called channels, and I can draw this data frame. So data frame is basically a multi-dimensional array with named columns, and I see that there are column for name, for members, and members now, this is a string with JSON array, it's, a, it's a, actually we can change it a bit, so we now map this column, with a, actually we rewrite this column with the same name, and we will map it with the help of this um, function. So let's take a look. So now it's a real array. So next. Uh, we want to add column with a number of uh, elements in this list, and uh, here it is. And by the way, uh, because data frames are kind of dynamic structures, we don't know the types in compile time. That's why on, in all such mappings, we currently need to specify it explicitly what kind of uh, column we are working with. So it's a bit um, tedious, but at least it type safe here. So we'll, we'll think how to improve it in future. So then we'll filter out all uh, empty channels and actually all small channels and take only columns we need, like uh, ID, name, members count, and uh, sort them at the end by the uh, count number. So let's take a look what we got. Something like this. So it's a list of top channels. Now let's draw a distribution like we did uh, last time for users. And we see that first seven channels are much bigger than all others. Do you know why? because they are default channels. When you join Slack, you are already a member of these seven channels. And so, um, okay, so we see that people are not evenly distributed uh, between them, obviously, and uh, also general, you have to be in general on Slack. But let's try to calculate intersections between all these channels. So uh, I'll create intersection which are from channels, and for each row in intersection, I will go and add a column which with a number of people um, that intersect this column and this row. So basically, I'm calculating how many people uh, are common in different channels. And um, let's take a look at intersection now. Yeah, so now we have uh, lots of columns for every channel with some intersection measure. It's, uh, I've normalized it by the number of people in the channel. And uh, let's draw it 
And uh, for this, I will use one more primitive called geom tile. And it needs a pairs of x, y, and the value. So I will use gather function on my uh, data frame to combine everything in such pairs. So I got this data frame now with the pairs of channels and measure of intersection. And let's plot it. It's big. <laughs> so uh, yeah, let's 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 take uh, just a uh, few of them, like like seventy. I didn't execute it. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, channels, intersection channels, take 70. Yeah, this image is much clearer. So uh, obviously there are uh, ones on a diagonal and ones in general, because everyone on, ch uh, on general channel but there are also lots of different outliers because we see that generally the uh, intersection measure uh, um, decreasing within, with the size of channel. But these outliers, it means that some channels are really interconnected. And we see that, for example, iOS connected with uh, multi-platform, Android bindings with Android architecture, and Russian feed with Russian. Also, we can see, can you see this kind of cells? So some channels are, are more isolated from the others. Uh, and uh, let's see, what are they? Like Brazil, India, French, Polish. So it means that we have strong local communities. Uh, and because of language barrier, they are, are, have less number of people in common with other channels. But let's do a trick now. Let's take this similarity matrix, convert it into matrix, bec uh, into matrix so we need to invert it, and one minus. And now run TSNE uh, algorithm on this. It's a kind of a physical an analog, uh, when you have number of points with elastic uh, strings between them, and uh, when you um, and you try to find the kind of a position which uh, energy uh, in um, energy energetically uh, the best one. So, um, fortunately, I found a library for this written in Java, and oop. So let's try to, to make it. And it needs this similarity matrix, x. And I tweaked several parameters. And now we can plot it with the help of geom points. And here it is. But actually, all these big channels, it, they, they actually uh, spoil this matrix. So let's uh, remove them. We'll take, say, tail. Unfortunately, there's no skip method. Um, channels and rows, minus seven. And row. And so let's recalculate it. So now all, every, every point has a single channel, and the closer points are, are the bigger intersection between these channels. So let's take a look at these clusters, like Android architecture, Android bindings here, uh, Vancouver, Latvia, China, China, Hong Kong, close, but not the same. 
Um, Nigeria, Minnesota, contributors, language proposals, they are all EAPs, Estadelib, Meta, so they are all close to each other. So it's a really interesting view on our Slack channel, and it's written, everything, everything written in Scotland. The last example, which I'm going to show, it's a very important thing, it's integration with Apache Spark. Apache Spark is a very popular um, framework for analyzing big data, and, but you can run it locally. It's a bit tricky, but we managed to run it locally, and uh, everything is as easy as just writing use Spark. I won't run it because it would be too long, because here I'm reading all messages and drawing them um, at, um, across the time. So, uh, but basically, everything is pretty clear. Like, I'm, I have a Spark context already because of this initialization block, and now I have a Spark read, read some uh, data with some predefined schema, uh, wrangling it a bit, and get then uh, messages with timestamps into different formats and name of the channel. Then calculate the top channels by grouping it by channel and counting them and sort in descending. And now we have different top channel, channels by the number of messages. And the, it's completely different image because we have now general, obviously, but then tornado effects. And it, it was a small uh, channel in terms of number of people. And then Android and so on. And then we can join them together and get uh, the number of uh, messages together with the count um, of uh, messages in, in, um, in um, the channel it contains. So, and finally, I can plot them. For this, I will use geom density and plot them all together and see when uh, different channels were popular, like Cobalt was popular in the beginning, Tornado FX, then again Cobalt, JavaScript, not now, but now rising multi-platform and Arrow. And uh, we can plot them because they, these uh, uh, plots are normalized, we can plot them one by one, uh, stacked layer it. And all of this with the help of Let's Plot library. Cool. So, and basically, I think that's it about um, using Jupyter kernel. Actually, I didn't last, uh, didn't run this last script because it was too long. But what I can do, I can scale it up and go to cluster now, and try to run the same script on cluster, uh, same notebook. So, uh, in this data engineering world, there are a bit different stack of technologies. And also, there's one more popular uh, notebook called Apache Zeppelin. And we wrote a Kotlin interpreter for it. It's kind of kernel for uh, Jupyter. And uh, we already merged it into master, and it will be available out of the box starting the next release. And it also has Spark support. And the cool thing is that you can share the code with Jupyter. So let's switch uh, to the back to the browser and go to the cluster. Here we have messages, basically the same notebook with some cosmetics uh, on top of it, because there are a bit different ways how to uh, represent uh, data frames and so on. But uh, yeah, the result is basically the same. We have plotted all this stuff together. Um, it has its own plotting engine inside, so we just re relied on it. And uh, so the main idea here is that you can share uh, the not only code, but also experience on different stages of data science. You can start 
playing with data first locally without cluster and then scale it up and play in cluster and it's really easy to start cluster as well. So, and if we take a look at uh, div, you, saw, you see we actually didn't change a lot when we adopted this code for um, running cluster. We changed uh, the path to data, um, some additional uh, regex because this data uh, lays in a different format, but basically that's it. One more example. Uh, because, so now on cluster, we can do something more heavy. So um, I've played with uh, wart embeddings. And uh, here again, like in, uh, we read the data, then we will sort, uh, we will split the messages into different tokens uh, based on some regex, filtering out um, how it's called HTML tags, some code snippets and uh, emojis. And uh, finally, we will remove also stop words, uh, so meaningless words. So now we have them like uh, divide all the as all, all these words could be filtered out. And let's take a look at the result. Uh, the result is here. So er early returns like that are code smell. Early returns like code smell. That's it. And actually, we are working now with uh, one gigabyte of data and uh, playing with it on cluster in real time, and everything is really fast. And it's a quite small cluster, actually, just eight nodes. And uh, now we can calculate um, word embeddings using these tokens. Uh, do you know what is it? It's a kind of when we get word and create a, a vector uh, which associated with this word based on its context in an original text. So, um, and it will take some time, like 10 minutes, I think. But fortunately, I already calculated it and saved. So we can now load it. And now we have this model. Um, and this model, for example, can find synonyms. Let's play with it. So let's f f try to find synonyms for Kotlin conf. Attending, <laughs> um, Droidcon, what else? MPP, multi-platform, Kakaopods, why are they are here? <laughs> IOS, GVM, um, okay, let's try Breslav. Andre, <laughs> talks Russian, keynote, talk hearing. It's now something. So based on this model, we can now uh, take all these words and basically try to cluster them together uh, based on um, using Cummins clustering algorithm. So uh, it's basically try, tries to find clusters of almost uniform size. Uh, would be, it will take some time. Here they are. So let's take a look at cluster sizes now. So we created 42 clusters, and uh, they are almost all the same size. Now we can, for each uh, find for each cluster, find its center, and find the closest words in this space of words to the, to tense, uh, to the center to describe the cluster. So, let's run it and show this data frame. So now we have a cluster zero and the closest words to is like paradigm, high level, academic, matlab, hipster. <laughs> Items, uh, what is it? Ah, object-oriented. <laughs> okay, and um, 
now we will do the same trick like we uh, did for channels. We will put them all uh, using TS and E. And uh, it also will take some time because the size of data set is much bigger. now. So basically I'm creating here the same matrix with distances between words. And then I will try to plot all the words based on this distance to understand what are basically the main topics in these uh, messages. So yeah, now I'm already running the uh, and iterating um, plotting algorithm, and let's create the final plot for it. We'll try to analyze it a bit. Later, we can use the same data frame, for example, for creating some prediction model. For example, you type a um, question, and then it automatically determines which channel you should write this uh, question to. So, oh, here it is. We have a map of words uh, with different clusters. Here's some tiempo, tiempo. It's, it's some language which I don't know. Um, Sierra, Fedora, Patches, Intel. So it's something about hardware. Um, server side, full stack, Vardin, Vue.js. So it's about some. Web technologies, oh, there are also two clusters here. I don't know what it's about. So it's a one more view for analyzing it. The last but not least thing here is big data tools. Have you heard about it? It's a new product from JetBrains. It was recently released as EAP. And it what it actually can do it's a plugin for IntelliJ IDEA. And here we can establish a Zeppelin connection and connect to Zeppelin server uh, using its pass. Let's put it here. And all my notebooks are here as well. And I can, it's like a Zeppelin but on steroids. And now it supports Kotlin as well. Originally it was created for Scala. And um, the, it's basically the same uh, notebook, and you can play with it. There's also charting. Probably they are not so good as in uh, in uh, original one, but it's still really a good beginning because we do believe that tooling matters. Well, and that's it about tools. Now let's talk a bit about libraries. So there are a lot of them. In Kotlin and in Java, there are lots of different libraries. Some of you actually are there. You are all sorts of some of them. So, and you can uh, use them for data science already, but there is a lack something in common between them. Like in Python ecosystem, there is a NumPy and all libraries are built on top of this. And that's why we created some experiment and we created Kotlin NumPy. So uh, let's take a look at code. It really looks like a NumPy and uh, really similar in terms of syntax. And, um, but the difference is that it's statically typed API. One more practical example, simple uh, neural network and if you are familiar with Py, uh, NumPy, it's basically almost the same syntax. But there are some differences. So uh, if I run this code on the left, the first statement is OK. But the second one will fall on runtime. Because uh, I'll try to um, incompatible types. A is uh, basically of type int. and uh, it couldn't be multiplied by double. 
uh, because internally, NumPy is statically typed. In Kotlin, it would be just an error in uh, compile time. And it's pretty important because, you know, there are sometimes really heavy computations, and it's really big pity when you uh, lose all your computation, computations in the last line. Internally, it's not a new library. It's bindings to NumPy. So we created a lightweight KTND array, and it has pointer to NumPy, and they both has pointer to the uh, same uh, block of native memory. And it means that we can actually uh, write uh, algorithms uh, using this uh, block through direct buffer. And uh, currently, we covered like almost 55% of NumPy uh, API. It's pretty a lot. It's recreation, manipulation, slicing, stacking, binary operations, all of this stuff. Uh, and um, the cool thing about performance, you may imagine that it would be much slower, but surprisingly it isn't. And uh, currently only indexing is slower, about one and a half times. But uh, many of other operations, especially iteration through um, the whole collection via iterator, is much faster. And that's great, because it provides us uh, a way to write our own libraries on top of this uh, with a good performance. And uh, the cool thing that we now can wrap other Python libraries if you have a Python, some Python library, like for example SciPy, and it depends on NumPy, when it needs a NumPy object, you can uh, give it NumPy object from corresponding Kotlin NumPy. And again, when we are returning NumPy object, we can return a Kotlin NumPy object as well. So let's sum up now. Today, I will show several new things. Actually, they all were released last, like. Uh, last um, last week, or actually even yesterday, uh, Jupyter kernel, Zeppelin interpreter, Kotlin, uh, and big data di uh, big data tool support, and two new libraries which are still experimenting. Obviously, Let's Plot and Kotlin NumPy. And the main idea behind all this uh, work is that we are actually trying to make Kotlin as a common instrument for data scientists, data engineers, and software developers, actually for us. So, but the thing is that it's ready to try right now. We need your feedback, and we will act on it. So, everything you need is behind this link. Kotlin, data science. And uh, finally, several words about our roadmap. Uh, oh. Please join us on Slack. Um, take a look at other data science talks in uh, KotlinConf. There was uh, two of them yesterday. And we are open to contributions. And regarding contributions, what's the roadmap? We are going to improve tooling in Jupyter and create a new uh, plugin for IntelliJ IDEA that will actually work like big data tools for Zeppelin, like a Jupyter plugin for uh, Jupyter. So uh, we are going to uh, improve tooling inside Jupyter because you, you saw this nightmare with typing and so on. Also libraries, the main project now is Kotlin API for Apache Spark, and we will continue to play with Kotlin NumPy and uh, evolving Let's Plot. We already understood that we need some language changes, and I will bring them to every design meeting. And uh, finally, there are something that I've already mentioned, that in some cases, for example, data frame, it's a, some object with um, dynamic by its nature. And we need to uh, have a way to calculate static APIs for it on the fly, and it would be really convenient. So, Kotlin Data Science, and thank you all for coming.